Hello and welcome to Dicebreaker, where we like to show off tabletop games that you absolutely need to try out. It's basically our job to give you tabletop FOMO. You dream of massive tables full of amazing board games with 40 players all warring over the shiniest new piece of cardboard. But let's be honest, uh, it's not always easy to get more than like maybe one friend to play some games with? Well, fret not. These games all play fantastically with just one extra player, and most are specifically designed for a group of two. So, with that in mind, I'm Wheels, subscribe to Dicebreaker, and here's five great board games for just two players. Undaunted is heavy in all regards. It's a heavy hitter reaching the four finalists of our Game of the Year Awards in 2022 for Best Board Game. It's a heavy game with a fairly chunky rulebook and plenty of components to keep track of, not to mention that you and your opponent are locked in for up to 15 sessions if you want to finish this campaign. It's a heavy subject matter, World War II, the destruction of a city, human conflict and loss. And lastly, it's just a heavy ass box. I mean, ugh, look at this thing. For that reason, I'm sure it doesn't shock you when I say that this game might not be for everyone. But if you can reckon with the themings, the weight, and the big buy-in, then what awaits you is a long campaign of one of the best modern war games around, reaching its absolute zenith. For the uninitiated, Undaunted is a series that abstracts historical war games that you associate with nitty-gritty rules and 400 different chits into an easily digestible battle of control using simple grid-based movement and Undaunted secret weapon, deck building. As you play, you'll position your squadrons around a section of Stalingrad's ever-evolving map. You'll grab your deck of soldiers from scouts to heavy machine gunners and shuffle up a basic deck. The rest of your platoons start laid out in a little display, waiting to reinforce as the game progresses. From there, each turn you'll be drawing four cards which will decide the squads that can take action. Your scouts will track across the map, laying out paths to allow the rest of your soldiers to move into new locations. Your riflemen are the backbone of the army, controlling vital objectives across the map, and your heavy machine gunners will be able to lay down a hail of bullets to either wipe out or suppress enemy forces. They're all incredibly useful, but you'll only be able to activate them if you've got a card to match. Your leadership cards are what allow you to change up the deck, using their bolster actions to reinforce your squads and introduce new cards into the deck. Stocking up on one unit will allow them to act more frequently and also protect them from damage, as any time your unit is successfully hit by enemy gunfire, you'll have to discard a matching card from somewhere in your deck. Each mission will see you competing over a new objective, vying for control of strategic headquarters, sending planes out on bombing runs, or picking off enemy forces with your crack squad of snipers. In between those missions, soldiers will die of injuries and need to be replaced with less effective reserves, or perhaps even be rewarded for their heroism with a promotion, allowing them to perform new abilities and improve their stats. Undaunted Stalingrad is a fantastic game for those that love to weave a story through their competitive play, with ever-evolving squads, battlegrounds that crumble over time, and a narrative to follow in your campaign books that changes to reflect your in-game results. If you've maybe ever thought about dipping your toes into miniature wargaming, for example, or if you're a big history buff with a friend to match, this could be the perfect game to last you for a long and arduous campaign into the hellish winters of Stalingrad. Inhuman Conditions feels depressingly relevant in its subject matter as of late with the power of artificial intelligence becoming a genuine issue for human workers everywhere, from artists to writers and beyond. Sometimes it's difficult to tell what's human and what's not, and nowhere is that more prominent than in inhuman conditions post-robot war world. You are an agent tasked with a simple job. Interview your provided subjects and determine whether or not they are a human or a robot. But, as simple as that task might seem, in practice your subjects can be a lot harder to read than you might think. Inhuman Conditions is a social deduction game for just two players, with each round only lasting about 10 minutes. If you're a fan of games like Werewolf, The Resistance, or even Among Us, but struggle to get big groups of people around a table to play, 
then this could be your perfect game. Over the course of five minutes exactly, the investigator will ask their potential robot friend a series of questions based on which interview module they've selected. It could be a simple bit of small talk, or they could be asking questions like, what do you think it would feel like to be on fire? Ugh. The investigator is looking out for abnormal behavior in their subject, strange turns of phrase, or perhaps avoiding topics, weird body language, or an obsession with one particular thing. That's because on the other side of the table, robot players trying to hide their identity have been given some very specific instructions. Every subject has a few things that are public information when the game begins. Their background tells us who this character they're playing is in the outside world, an amateur wrestler, a cult leader, sponsored by an energy drink. Their penalty is something that they'll have to perform in conversation if they ever mess up their objective as a robot. Point at something in the room, say two words that rhyme, interrupt the investigator. These are useful tools for driving conversation and even provide a very clear thing for the investigator to look out for. But the most important information lies on their card that sits in front of them, hidden. The human has no information on their card, they're just a human and they just want to get through the interview without getting murdered by the government agent on the other side of the table. Fair enough. Robots, on the other hand, have specific conditions that they'll need to fulfill or abide by to try and either make it through the interview unscathed, or in the case of violent robots, murder the investigator on the other side of the table. I mean, it, it's only fair. Robots can have all sorts of weird quirks that will potentially give away their non-human status, but whether the investigator will notice them is up to their ability to read body language and probe for the right information or perhaps lack thereof. Once your interview is complete, you'll need to make a decision on whether this subject is getting let go or decommissioned. Just don't send a human to the grinder or let a robot go free. There will be consequences. If you want to learn more, you can see our full immersive Let's Play that we did on the channel not long ago by clicking the card in the corner of the screen. The year is 1929 and Captain Sophie Odessa and her crew of the good ship Manticore find themselves lost in a strange and mysterious land. A 20th century odyssey awaits you and up to three other players as your steamship travels across this otherworldly plane, trying to get home. You'll have to work together in this cooperative story-driven experience, exploring exotic islands, meeting interesting new characters, and desperately search for the ancient totems of the eponymous sleeping gods to awaken them and unlock the way back to your own world. From the designer behind games like Near and Far and Above and Below, Sleeping Gods takes the same design philosophy of combining Eurogame mechanics with weaving and open-ended storytelling. This is a campaign game which means that you and your friend will be coming back to the mysterious waters of this strange world quite a few times before you're done with it, which is backed up by a core mechanic that lets players stop whenever they feel like it and save their progress video game style. When you're next ready to play, you pick up right where you left off and continue your adventure. And what an adventure it will be! If you've played one of these storybook style games before, you'll understand the basics, a sort of choose your own adventure that lets you pick from multiple options, guides you down your own unique path that could vary wildly from the experiences of other people that have played the game. Your goal is to find at least 14 totems of the gods before you'll end your campaign, but the way in which you do that and the places you search is completely up to you with your steamship passing from point to point on this flip through map book each location providing new adventures and opportunities. Depending on the sailors that you crew your ship with, you'll have different options to choose from when faced with dilemmas, and each crewmate has their own specialities when it comes to manning the manticore. I don't want to go too far into specifics of what you'll find in Sleeping Gods, lest I spoil your experience, but if you're in the mood for a fantasy adventure that you'll not soon forget in a strange and original fantasy setting, then you can do a lot worse than this absolutely beloved storytelling board game.
What happens when you combine air hockey with magnets? You get Clask, possibly one of the best dexterity games ever made, and it's specifically designed for one-on-one -on -one play. Two would-be class champions will play a series of rounds on this custom wooden board in which they'll attempt to score six points before their opponent. The players will be controlling these little black poles that sit on each end of a sort of football or basketball that's court. But you won't be moving these poles around physically like an air hockey mallet. Instead, you'll be holding this magnet underneath the board. Using said magnet, you'll be able to slide your player piece around the table and whack this little white ball back and forth. There's three ways in which you can score points in Clask. The first one is easy. Hit this white ball into the hole on your opponent's side of the board. That's a goal and is the most basic way of scoring. Okay, all pretty standard air hockey fare so far, but the other two ways of scoring points are through your opponent's own slip-ups. If you ever lose control of your own player piece, that counts as a point for the other player. You might accidentally drop your counter into your own goal, for example, blocking your own movement. Or you may have noticed that in the middle of the underside of the board is a wall between you and the other player's hand. This serves two purposes. One, it stops you from both aggressively fist bumping each other every two seconds. And two, it's a hard blocker for your magnet, which means if you fling your player piece to the other side of the board by accident, it's gone and you've given away a point. The second way in which you can give points to your enemy is through a new game piece we'll introduce called Biscuits. Yes, that is what they're actually called. These three little white magnets start each round lined up in the middle of the board, but beware getting too close to them as having two or more magnets stuck to your player piece results in another point going to your opponent. Clask is deceptively simple, whacking a small ball around the board and avoiding any slip ups as you try to go for goal. But as with most dexterity games, there's always a few hidden strategies that unlock themselves in your brain as you play. Those biscuits, for example, aren't static, and if you're a sure shot, you can actually ping them onto your adversary's side of the board and lay down an absolute minefield for them to navigate as they play. If you're even more accurate, you can try and fire those biscuits into the opposition goal, making it impossible for them to go too near and defend without the risk of getting covered in biscuits. Some pros will even use their serving shot to hit one of the biscuits as hard as they can and attempt to ping it off the board, removing any chance of them being attacked by them. What's that I hear you ask? Some pros. <laughs> Wheels, are you being hyperbolic again? Oh no, my friends, not this time. Clask has a fully fledged competitive scene with yearly world championships. And if you want to someday become the best class player in the world, well, you better grab a copy and get practicing. Unmatched creators Rob Davo and Justin D. Jacobson really said, what if we just took public domain characters and made them unbelievably badass and then made it into a board game? And they succeeded in that endeavor, in fact, though technically it was a remake of previous game, Star Wars Epic Duels. Unmatched pits these characters against each other and has them duke it out one-on-one -on -one until a victor emerges. Though there have been several unmatched games released, including Cobble and Fog, which features characters from Victorian era literary greats, as Robin Hood vs. Bigfoot, in which the two forest dwellers battle it out to crown a king, but we're going to be talking about its very first release today. If you like the sound of this though, there's nothing to stop you from checking out the others, and you can combine the sets together. Unmatched Battle of Legends Volume 1 is a 2-4 player game that features not only legendary heroes like Medusa, Sinbad, Alice in Wonderland, and King Arthur, but also their sidekicks, the Harpies, the Porter, the Jabberwock, and Merlin. And I say sidekicks like that because it's utterly wild that Merlin would be relegated to the role of sidekick. I mean, sidekicks don't even get their own mini. Each hero has their own strengths that they play to as they travel across the color-coded board. For example, Arthur needs to get up close and personal to wield Excalibur effectively, but Medusa flourishes when she and her harpies stay as far away from him as possible and launch ranged attacks. At the start of the game, you draw a hand of five beautifully styled cards that each reflect your character and their abilities and story and cool alternative fashion. Seriously, look at these cards. Just behold them. So good. You draw a card on your turn and that gives you some lovely movement. Movement is very important because those color-coded squares I mentioned earlier are zones. And as long as you're in the same zone as a ranged attacker, they can hit you. 
so you may want to skedaddle on out of there if you're a melee attacker who needs to be adjacent to attack. Attacking is very simple. The attacker selects a card with an attack value on it, and the defender selects a card with a defend value on it. The defender takes the difference in those two values as damage. Easy peasy, right? Then comes the last phase of the round, which is called scheming. Which I really appreciate because we should all be given the chance to scheme a little bit more often, don't you think? It allows you to do all sorts of cool and kooky things like Alice's ability to grow and shrink and automatically summoning Arthur's trusty Excalibur to the player's hand. The game is a simple bit of fun that allows you to jump into gameplay very easily and offers endless opportunities to expand upon gameplay through expansions like Jurassic Park and Marvel, meaning you can finally see who would win in a fight between a bunch of dinosaurs and Squirrel Girl. Though the game facilitates two to four players, playing with two is equally as fun as playing with more, it means you really have to try to preempt your opponent's moves, use your abilities and schemes as effectively as possible. It makes a great game to play with a pal or even on a date night to add a bit of playful nonsense to the evening. Well, there you have it. Five fantastic board games for just two players that you should try out in 2023. If you've enjoyed your stay here and would like some more board game recommendations, then do not fret because we here at Dicebreaker have you more than covered. Give us a like and subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we put a new video live. You can also head on over to our home and hearth, dicebreaker.com, the veritable home of tabletop journalism, for a shed load more articles on our favorite cardboard and plastic-based hobby. But until I see you next time, thank you very much for watching. I've been Wheels, and I hope you have a lovely day.